Greetings and peace to you. I hope you're well and in good health of a sober mind and in spiritual equilibrium. Today we are continuing Father Jacques Felipe's Interior Freedom, Part 4, Accepting Other People. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, green or blessed, and in our hearts take up thy rest. Come with thy grace and heavenly aid to fill the hearts which thou hast made. To fill the hearts which thou hast made. Part 4 Accepting Other People Consenting to Sufferings Caused by Others Earlier, we spoke of accepting difficulties with a good will, instead of hardening ourselves against them. This idea can be applied to the difficulties that arise by someone else's fault. How should we react to all the sufferings caused by people around us? Our line of conduct should be exactly the same, to consent to them. Once more, it is not a question of being merely passive. Sometimes we must confront someone whose actions have made us suffer and help him or her realize what has been done and put it right. Sometimes, too, we have a duty to react firmly against unjust situations and protect ourselves or others against harmful actions. But there will always remain a certain amount of suffering that comes from those around us and that we can neither avoid nor correct. Then we are invited to accept it with hope and forgiveness. It is harder to accept that sort of suffering than material difficulties. A man can more easily accept missing an appointment because his car broke down than because his wife spent an hour on the telephone with a friend. We see people's freedom at work in their failings and reckon that they could have acted differently if they had wanted to. Hard as it is, we need to learn to forgive other people for making us suffer or disappointing us, and even to accept the problems they create for us as graces and blessings. The attitude is neither spontaneous nor natural, but it is the only way by which to achieve peace and interior freedom. Making allowances for differences in temperament. When other people cause us sufferings, we should not automatically see ill will on their part, though that is what we tend to do. Many interpersonal problems, which we are quick to judge morally wrong, are simply communication difficulties and misunderstandings. Our different ways of expressing ourselves and different psychological filters make it hard to perceive one another's real intentions. People have very different and sometimes conflicting temperaments and ways of seeing things. And that is something to be recognized and accepted cheerfully. Some love to have everything in order and are upset by the slightest disorder. 
others feel stifled when everything is overly organized and regulated. Those who love order feel threatened by anyone who leaves the smallest object out of place. Those with the opposite temperament feel they are being attacked by anyone who insists on perfect tidiness. We are quick to attach moral judgments to such behavior, calling what pleases us good and what doesn't bad. Examples abound. We must be careful not to turn our families and communities into permanent war zones divided between defenders of order and defenders of freedom, partisans of punctuality and partisans of easy goingness, lovers of peace and quiet and lovers of exuberance, early birds and night owls, chatterers and taciturn types, and so on. We need to accept other people just as they are, understand that their approach and values are not the same as ours, and to broaden our minds and soften our hearts toward them. That isn't easy. It means seeing our own wisdom in relative terms and becoming small and humble. We must learn to renounce the pride we take in being right, which often prevents us from entering into the other person's thoughts. And that renunciation sometimes requires a dying to ourselves that is extremely hard. But we stand to gain everything by it. It's fortunate that other people's outlook conflicts with ours. Since then, we have the chance to escape our narrow-mindedness and open ourselves to other values. I have lived in a community for 25 years, and I may have received more from people I found it hard to get along with than from those I found congenial. Those I found hard to get along with opened my horizons to other values, but if I'd only met people who agreed with me, I might never have glimpsed any new horizons. Some Reflections on Forgiveness Of course, there are cases. Of course, there are cases when the suffering other people cause us is due to a real fault on their part. The proper attitude, then, is not understanding in accepting forgiveness. Forgive me. The proper attitude, then, is not understanding and accepting for differences, but something more demanding and difficult, forgiveness. Modern culture doesn't rate forgiveness very highly. More often, it justifies resentment and revenge. But does that reduce the amount of evil in the world? The only way to diminish the suffering that burdens mankind is by forgiveness. In proclaiming forgiveness and love of enemies, the Church is aware of adding to the spiritual heritage of all humanity a new mode of human relationships, an arduous mode, to be sure, but one that is also rich in hope. In this, the Church knows she can rely on the help of the Lord, who never abandons those who turn to Him in times of difficulty. Love is not resentful. 1 Corinthians 13.5 With these words from the first letter to the Corinthians, 
the Apostle Paul recalls that forgiveness is one of the highest forms of the practice of charity. This is not the place to develop the theme of forgiveness, which is fundamental but complex. It bears repeating, however, that unless we understand the importance of forgiveness and practice it in our relations with others, we will never achieve inner freedom, but will always be prisoners of our own bitterness. When we refuse to forgive someone for harm done to us, we are adding another wrong to the first. That solves nothing at all. We are increasing the quantity of evil in the world, which has quite enough as it is. Let us not join in the propagation of evil. St. Paul tells us, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Certain things must be borne in mind if we are to remove the obstacles that make forgiveness difficult, even impossible. Forgiving is not the same as condoning a wrong. Sometimes we think, consciously or subconsciously, that forgiving someone who has wronged us would mean pretending they had done nothing wrong, calling bad good, or condoning an act of injustice. But forgiving does not mean that. Truth mustn't be mocked. Forgiving means saying, This person has wronged me, but I don't want to condemn him. I don't want to identify him with his fault. I don't want to take justice into my own hands. God is the only one who searches mind and heart and judges justly. And I leave it to him to weigh this person's actions and pronounce judgment. That is a difficult and delicate task that belongs to God. And I don't want to take the burden of it on myself. What's more, I don't want to pass a final judgment with no appeal on the person who has hurt me. I want to look at him with eyes of hope, because I believe something can grow and change in him, and I continue to want his good. I also believe that from the evil done to me, even if it seems irremediable from a human viewpoint, God can draw good. Ultimately, we can really forgive people only because Christ rose from the dead. His resurrection is the guarantee that God can cure every wrong and every hurt. The Chains of Resentment When we forgive someone, while well, we are, in a sense, doing good to that person by canceling a debt, we are doing much good to ourselves. We rediscover a freedom that we were at risk of losing through resentment and hurt feelings. Freedom can be diminished by overly strong attachments, by a dependence on someone whom we love too much and in the wrong way, who becomes so indispensable to us that we partly lose our autonomy. But a refusal to forgive also binds us to the person we resent and diminishes or destroys our freedom. We are as dependent on the people we hate as on those we love in a disproportionate manner. When we foster resentment towards someone, 
we can't stop thinking about him. We are filled with negative feelings that absorb a large part of our energy. And so there is an investment in that relationship that does not leave us available psychologically and spiritually for what we should be concentrating on. Resentment attacks our vital forces and does us much harm. When someone has made us suffer, our tendency is to keep the memory of the wrong alive in our minds, like a bill we will produce in due time to demand settlement. Those accumulated bills end up poisoning our lives. It is wiser to cancel every debt, as the gospel invites us to. In return, we will be forgiven everything, and our hearts will be set free. Whereas nurturing resentment towards others closes us to the positive things they could contribute to us. The measure you give will be the measure you get back. One of the more beautiful passages in the gospel is Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 38. It is a basic text that should guide us in our attitude toward others. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Lend. Expect nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the selfish. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. These words are very demanding, but we need to understand the demand as a magnificent gift. God wants to give us. God gives what he commands, and this text contains a promise. God can transform our hearts to the point that they become capable of loving with a love that is as pure, freely given, and disinterested as God's own love. God wants to give us the gift of forgiving as he alone can do, and so make us like himself. We might say the whole mystery of our redemption in Christ, by his incarnation, his death, and his resurrection, consists of this marvelous exchange. In the heart of Christ, God has loved us humanly, so as to render our human hearts capable of loving divinely. God became man so that man might become God, might love as only God is capable of loving, with the purity, intensity, power, tenderness, and inexhaustible patience that belong to divine love. It is an extraordinary source of hope and a great consolation to know that by virtue of God's grace working in us, if we remain open to it by persevering in faith, prayer, and the sacraments, the Holy Spirit will transform and expand our hearts to the point of one day making them capable of loving as God loves. Notice that the Gospel passage just quoted ends with one of the fundamental laws of the spiritual life, in fact, of human life. The measure you give will be the measure you get back. 
on the face of it, this could simply mean that God will be generous in rewarding those who are generous in loving and forgiving, and will give a smaller reward to those whose attitude toward others has been mean. But the phrase has a deeper sense. God does not punish anyone. People punish themselves. The gospel expresses a law that is part and parcel of being human. Those who refuse to forgive, who refuse to love, will sooner or later be victims of their own lack of love. The evil we do to or wish on others will end up turning against us. Those who are strict with their neighbor will suffer that strictness. Our judgments, mistrust, rejection, or resentment imprison us in a net that will strangle us. Our deepest aspirations for the absolute, the infinite, will be blocked and go unfulfilled because lack of mercy toward another has enclosed us in a world of calculation and self-interest. This is an inexorable law. You will never get out till you have paid the last penny. Forgiveness releases us from that curse. The cancellation of debts that it brings about makes possible a relation to the other based on free give and take, which is essential to genuine love. And none of us can live without genuine love. When our hearts feel cramped, very often we need seek no other reason than this. We are refusing to love and forgive generously. Generosity in love and forgiveness make us sons of the Most High and set us free to explore the limitless oceans of God's love and life, where the deepest aspirations of our own hearts will one day be satisfied. If you love your neighbor, Isaiah tells us, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. Badness, how other people's faults can be good for us. Badness isn't all bad. The bad behavior of those around us, which causes us suffering, offers certain benefits. In our relations with other people, we naturally seek that which we lack, and especially what we lacked in childhood. Other people's imperfections and the disappointments they cause us oblige us to establish a relationship with them that is not limited to an unconscious search for satisfaction of our needs, but tends to become pure and disinterested like God's love. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Those imperfections also help us not to look to others for happiness, plenitude, and fulfillment we can only find in God. Thus they invite us to take root in God. Disappointment in a relationship with someone from whom we were expecting a lot, perhaps too much, can teach us to go deeper in prayer, in our relationship with God, and to look to Him for that fullness, that peace and security that only His infinite love can guarantee. Disappointments in relationships with other people oblige us to pass from idolatrous love to a love that is realistic, free, and happy. Romantic love will always be threatened with disappointments. Charity never is, because it does not insist on its own way, 
or seek its own interest. Other people's offenses take nothing from us. One of the biggest obstacles to forgiving is the feeling that the other party's behavior has deprived us of something important, even vital. This confused feeling nourishes resentment. The thing in question may be material or affective or moral, not getting the love I had a right to, or the esteem, etc., or even spiritual. The behavior of the person at the head of my community keeps my spiritual life from developing as it should. To live at peace, even when it is the people around us who are causing us suffering, we must take a fresh, radical look at our frustration It does not correspond to reality. Other people's faults do not deprive us of anything. We have no valid reason for resenting them or their actions. On the material plane, of course, other people can deprive us of many things, but not of what is essential. The only true and lasting good God's love for us, and the love we can have for him with the inner growth it produces. Nobody can prevent us from believing in God, hoping in him, and loving him everywhere and in all circumstances. Faith, hope, and love make human beings fully human. All else is secondary relative. Even if we are deprived of it, that is not an absolute evil. There is within us something indestructible that is guaranteed by God's faithfulness and love. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Rather than wasting time and energy blaming others for what isn't working out, or reproaching them for what we think they are depriving us of, we should strive to acquire spiritual autonomy by deepening our relationship with God, the one unfailing source of all good, and growing in faith, hope, and disinterested love. That others are sinners cannot prevent us from becoming saints. Nobody really deprives us of anything. At the end of our lives, when we come face to face with God, it would be childish to blame others for our lack of spiritual progress. The Trap of Indifference Sometimes we are particularly worried about things that are not going well around us, in our community, our family, or our church circle. We are tempted to get discouraged and give up. That is when we have to tell ourselves, whatever happens, whatever mistakes and faults are committed by this person or that, it robs us of exactly nothing. Even though we lived among people who were committing mortal sins from morning till night, that could not prevent us from loving God and serving our neighbor, or deprive us of any spiritual gift, or stop us from tending toward the fullness of love. The world could collapse around us, but it wouldn't rob us of the possibility of praying, placing all all our trust in God, and loving That doesn't mean shutting ourselves in an ivory tower and being indifferent to what is going on around us or remaining passive. When there are problems, we should want them solved and try to see what God is asking of us. Should we intervene? Can we do something positive? If the answer is yes, 
it would be a sin of omission to do nothing. But if everything seems to be going wrong around us, it is all the more necessary to preserve our freedom to hope in God and serve Him joyfully and enthusiastically. The devil often tries to discourage us and make us lose our joy in serving God. One means he uses particularly is to make us worry about everything that is not going well around us. Suppose, for example, we are living in community. To make us lose dynamism and spiritual energy, the devil will lead us to notice a host of negative things, the unfair attitudes of the people in charge, our brothers' and sisters' mistakes and lack of fervor, their faults, sometimes even serious ones, and so on. The weight of worry, insecurity, sadness, and discouragement will weaken our spiritual verve. What use is it to make such an effort to pray and be generous when there are all these problems? It is a short step to lukewarmness. We must unmask this temptation and say, no matter what happens, I've got nothing to lose. I need to maintain my fervor, continue to love God, and pray with all my heart, and love the people I'm living with, even if I don't know how things will turn out. I won't be wasting my time, and it's not wrong to try to love. Love will never be in vain. St. John of the Cross said, Where there is no love, put love, and you will harvest love. If problems cause us to become sad and lose our fervor, we've solved nothing but only added another problem to the rest. If the sins of those around us lead us to become upset and discouraged, we are helping to spread the evil more rapidly. Evil is only overcome by good, and we can only put a stop to the spread of sin by fervor, joy, and hope. Doing all the good we can today without worrying about tomorrow. The real harm is not outside us, but within us. At times of struggle, we need also to recall the conversion we should be concerned about is not our neighbor's, but our own. Only if we take our conversion seriously do we stand any chance of seeing our neighbor converted too? This point of view is realistic and encouraging. We have little real influence on other people, and our attempts to change them have only a very slight chance of success, since most of the time we want them to change in line with our criteria and aims more than God's. If we are concerned first with our own conversion, however, we have more hope of making a difference. It does more good to seek to reform our hearts than to reform the world or the church. Everyone will benefit. Let us ask ourselves this question. To what degree can the evil in my surroundings affect me? With apologies to those I am going to scandalize, I say that the evil around us, the sins of other people, of people in the church, of society, does not become an evil for us unless we let it penetrate our hearts. The point isn't that we should become indifferent, just the opposite. The holier we are, the more we will suffer due to the evil and sin in the world. But external evil only harms us to the degree we react badly to it by fear, worry, discouragement, sadness, 
giving up, rushing to apply hasty solutions that don't solve anything, judging, fostering bitterness and resentment, refusing to forgive, and so on. Jesus says in St. Mark's Gospel, There is nothing outside a man which by going into him can defile him, but the things which come out of a man are what defile him. Harm does not come to us from external circumstances, but from how we react to them interiorly. What ruins our souls is not what happens outside, but the echo that it awakens within us. The harm that other people do to me never comes from them. It comes from me. Harm is only self-inflicted, the fathers of the church said long ago. Our complicity increases the harm. When we concentrate too much on something that isn't right and make it our main topic of conversation, we end up giving evil more substance than it has. Deploring evil sometimes only strengthens it. I recently heard a priest say, I'm not going to spend my life denouncing sin. That would be doing it too much honor. I would rather encourage good than condemn evil. And I think he was right. This is not a head-in-the-sand attitude, but the optimism of charity. Love is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. As we ourselves advance more surely and effectively, by giving ourselves totally to the good despite our defects, so also we do more to help others experience conversion and make progress by encouraging them in the positive aspects of their lives than by condemning their errors. Good is more real than evil, and it can overcome evil. <coughs> we sometimes experience a savage satisfaction in detecting and showing up something wrong. The resentment and bitterness we feel arise from a spiritual void within us and the sense of dissatisfaction it produces. Often, the most critical people are those with the greatest spiritual emptiness. One wonders whether they must create enemies for themselves in order to exist. Evil comes to fill a gap. Jesus was surrounded by a sea of evil, hatred, violence, and lies. His heart was broken and pierced, and he suffered more than anyone has ever suffered but the wrong done to him did not penetrate him because his heart was full of trust in his father, abandonment, and loving self-offering. We should follow in his steps. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. So too, with Our Lady at the foot of the cross, she drank the cup of suffering, but her heart remained pure. It held no fear, no rebellion, no hatred, no despair, but only acceptance, forgiveness, and hope. If the wrongs people commit do penetrate our hearts, that is because they find room there. If suffering makes us bitter and ill-humored, it is because our hearts are devoid of faith, hope, and love. But if our hearts are filled with total trust in God and love for him and our neighbor, there is no room for evil, hurt, and harm. 
St. Maximilian Kolbe died in the starvation bunker at Auschwitz, but his heart remained pure and intact in that hellish place, because he felt no hatred for his executioners and consented to give up his life for love. He and his companions sang the Magnificat as they were dying. They conquered evil with good. The ability to remain untouched by evil is not acquired all at once. It is the fruit of a long process of self-conquest and grace that makes us grow in the theological virtues. It is an aspect of spiritual maturity, more a gift from God than the result of our efforts. But this gift will be given to us more quickly and surely the more we strive for it, desire it, and try to practice the attitudes described here, rooting ourselves in God through faith and prayer, not blaming people and things around us for what isn't going well in our lives, and stop seeing ourselves as victims, resolutely shouldering responsibilities and accepting our lives as they are, and using our present capacity for believing, hoping, and loving to the full at every moment. The Royal Freedom of God's Children In baptism, we are anointed with sweet-smelling oil as the sign of our new character. By our union with Christ, each of us is priest, prophet, and king. We are kings because we are children and heirs of the King of heaven and earth, but also in the sense that we are subject to nothing and everything is subject to us. Oh, I watch. We are kings because we are children and heirs of the King of heaven and earth, but also in the sense that we are subject to nothing and everything is subject to us. This is what happens to us when we let the grace of baptism operate in us, living as God's children in faith, hope, and love. Yes, we know suffering and sorrow, but everything that happens serves to make us grow in love and in the fact of being God's children. What happens and how others behave can no longer touch us negatively. They can only promote our true good, which is to love. St. Paul expresses that sense of royal freedom, the privilege of Christians living in the arms of God our Father, by saying, All things are yours. And he adds, And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. This also is beautifully expressed by St. John of the Cross in his Prayer of the Soul in Love. Why do you hesitate? Why do you wait? For you can, from this instant, love God in your heart. Mine are the heavens, and mine is the earth, and mine are the peoples. The just are mine, and mine are the sinners. The angels are mine, and the mother of God and all things are mine, and God himself is mine and for me, because Christ is mine and holy for me. What do you ask for then? And what do you seek, my soul? All of that is yours and for you. Thus ends the reading. I hope this blesses you and keeps you on the way. I hope that we will all one day meet each other in eternity and laugh at all the times we struggled to let go and forgive and move forward in God. May God bless you. May God love you. May God's peace be yours forever. Pray for me as I pray for you. In the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit.